All right. I would uh, like to spend a minute talking about the difficulty that we often have as communities confronting very difficult challenges and issues. And I'd like to begin with a quote from uh, this artist, Wayne Thiebaud. I read what I thought was a very interesting quote. And he, talking about the process that he goes through to paint an object like this cake, he says of that process, there's never a point at which I stop learning about that object. Now, I know that that may be obvious to probably most of you. To me, it was a very interesting new idea. I just come from many years immersed in the scientific method. A lot of confidence about science being the way to learn about things. So that was a new interesting idea that I thought about a lot and one that was uh, driven home to me a little later on, a few years later, when I was at a very uh, informal luncheon and just by lucky circumstance happened to be eating, taking my lunch next to uh, a former poet laureate of the United States. Uh, someone who knows a lot about art and uh, those sorts of things. And so I screwed up my courage and asked him a question. And what I asked was, when someone reads a poem of yours, do they discover something new that science can't teach them? And is that thing as real as what science can teach? And thankfully, he was very kind and gracious and said, of course, absolutely. But the example he used to illustrate his point I thought was a very powerful one. And what he brought up was this photograph that many of you recognize from the Kent State shootings. And what he said was, and you can see by looking at the photograph, his point immediately is so graphically demonstrated, that this photograph, this piece of art, tells us something very critical about that moment. And that is the emotion, the raw emotion of that moment, particularly for this woman right here. Uh, something if you didn't understand, you would probably be undereducated about that moment in our history. Uh, science can't do that. What can science tell me about that instant? Well, what was the trajectory of the bullet that passed through this uh, unfortunate young person here? What was the damage that was caused to his body that caused death? You know, what was the composition of the blood of this woman as uh, she went through these different emotions, as hormones rushed in and out and all of those things? All kinds of very interesting, important things. But what it can't tell me is this emotion. That's what art does. And in fact, the artist is not limited by the physical facts at all, really, to tell something real about that moment. You can imagine the artist altering all of this in all kinds of ways, cutting it up and arranging it around, or imposing another image upon it, or staining it all red to show the violence, or whatever the case may be. And a scientist could legitimately come to that work of art and tell the artist, well, that's all wrong. That's not true. Those people were not red. And of course, the artist's response would be, so what? You know, you just don't get it. And the scientist could say, well, they still weren't red. You're still wrong. And of course, both of them would be absolutely correct. But for different reasons. We come up with this very interesting thing, and that is here's the realm of science, completely limited by measurement and uh, observation. What it is that it can tell me, it can tell me all these things that art cannot. And art driven by creativity and imagination, the artist just imagining things in her mind and presenting them in a way that tells me something real about my life experience or reality. And the two methods are so wildly different as almost to have no connection to each other at all. But once in a while, they overlap. Was the grass really green or red? Or were the people really green or red? A science, scientist can talk about that. Whether the discussion's relevant or not, that is the legitimate little bit of overlap. Well, I think this has uh, uh, some interesting impact on how we communicate within our communities about difficult issues. And to illustrate that, I want to bring up another historic moment. One of my favorites, Galileo, the, the, the modern, you know, the father of modern science is Galileo. 
And uh, if you remember, Galileo constructed a telescope. He put it up to the heavens and was the first to see all kinds of amazing things. The first one to see the moons of Jupiter and how they revolved around Jupiter. Uh, the first one to watch the phases of Venus as it revolved around the sun and saw all kinds of these amazing things and concluded Copernicus is right. The earth moves around the sun and the sun does not move around the earth. The church instead had a different feeling because of various statements within the Bible had the, sta the stand that the earth did not move. It was fixed and immovable. So to make a very interesting and dramatic story short, Galileo was pulled up to the Inquisition in Rome. Uh, they demanded that he recant his views. And when shown the instruments of torture, he said, okay, 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 the earth does not move, the, the sun moves. Um, according to legend, a wonderful legend, um, at the moment that he recanted, he says under, in, in a whisper, so only the people close to him could hear, he says, a pur si muove. And yet it moves. You can make me say whatever you'd like, but it doesn't change the fact that the earth moves. Uh, why would you even make me do that? I looked in my telescope. And so this issue has long, of course, been resolved, and that's the, the reason that I picked it. That's the, whether the earth moves or not is not a, a, a contentious issue for any of us. But it brings up this, this interesting example again. If I were to go back to 1633 and talk to a person of faith at that time, what would they say? They'd say, I imagine, my faith has absolutely nothing to do with your silly luck telescope. Uh, I have not seen nor ear heard the things that God has prepared for me, but he has revealed them to us through his spirit. This is my adventure into the unmeasurable, and it's informed my life in all kinds of interesting ways. It's given me this morality on which to base my life on. It tells me about sin and repentance and judgment and heaven and hell and all of these things that for me matter that your science has, can tell me nothing about because you're so obsessed on measurement. And the scientist, today's scientist anyway, would respond, science was so new then, would respond with something like, well, I restrict myself to measurement and observation. And it's told me all kinds of amazing things about quarks and gravity and ecosystem dynamics or whatever it is, whatever it is. All of these interesting things that your religion says nothing about. And the person of faith might have said and often says, well, what you're doing is trying to destroy my faith. And the scientists would say, oh no, heavens no. What I'm trying to do is defend the legitimacy of this. You are trying to ignore the facts and you're using your silly faith as an excuse. Well, heavens no. All I'm doing is defending the legitimacy of this. And what we've done is successfully ended all productive dialogue because, and in reality, what we're talking about are two such completely different things as to have almost nothing to do with each other. Except these few instances where there's overlap and there's a legitimate discussion. Does the earth really move or not? Well, science turns out has a lot to say about that and can have a lot to say about that. There are a few of those issues, but they're so small because the perspectives are so wildly different. Well, I think that that's, I think that that's important. I think that's an important thing to think about as we confront these images or these issues and these challenges. I mean, just take science and religion or art and science or whatever it is and replace them with uh, uh, Republican and Democrat or conservative and liberal or uh, Tea Party conservative and establishment Republican or, or uh, white police officers and black citizens of a town like Ferguson or uh, any number of viewpoints around any issue that you want to pick, water, immigration, same-sex marriage, whatever it is that we're arguing about, I suspect, I believe that in almost every instance, what you'll find is something like this. Two such wildly different 
experiences. Uh, two such wildly different uh, motivations or goals or culture or whatever the case may be, that they are so different that when they overlap, it makes it almost impossible to have a productive dialogue when that overlap happens, like these issues that I just mentioned and many, many others that we can talk about. So the problem is not, in my opinion, that we disagree. The problem instead is that we so know so little about each other that it's impossible to talk about anything when it is that our views or experiences collide. And so the solution is what? It's not shouting louder, it's not refining our arguments. The solution instead, and I believe the very best step we can take forward in improving our dialogue as communities in confronting these challenges, is to learn more about each other. Uh, the, the, the result would not be I've decreased my uh, passion about my perspective, um, but maybe the result would be empathy. Um, I understand. I still feel like you're wrong, but I get it. Now that I understand your perspective, whatever it is, I can see how a reasonable person in that situation could come to the conclusion you come to. And you can for me as well. If that single thing were to happen, wouldn't that be the perfect foundation on which to have a meaningful, productive dialogue as we confront whatever difficult issue happens to be confronting us? So why don't we? Uh, why don't we spend the time to learn about each other that way? And I think that there's uh, many interesting reasons why that is, that I believe why that is, and I'll focus on just one. Uh, and that is, where do we have that discussion? Where do I go to investigate the perspective of someone that feels so opposite that I do? Where do I do that? And today we have almost nowhere to do that. We are so convinced that whatever organization or facility or group of people are so tainted by their bias, by me approaching them on their territory, I'm being led by the hand down the path to destruction. And I just can't let myself do it. We're so tainted by our strong views that we have no neutral spot to go to to learn about each other so that we can have a productive dialogue and solve our, 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 our issues together. Where do we go? Where I don't feel like I'm gonna be proselytized or convinced or tricked or seduced by the other. Well, I think there is a place. And those that know me probably already know where I'm going and that is the museum. I believe that museums offer our society the very best chance to talk more constructively about our problems. And I'll tell you why that is. Um, first, uh, museums are for absolutely everyone. How many organizations can you think of that everybody goes to? No matter the culture or economic level or cultural background or religious background or gender or what, whatever division we divide ourselves in, how many organizations feel welcoming to everybody? Not very many. The museum is it. Um, next, we are already all going to museums. Uh, more people visit museums than you might imagine. So if you were to take all the attendance to every major league sporting event in the country for a year, take all the attendance for every theme park in the entire country for a year, and you added up all that attendance and you would have well over 400 million visits. That's a lot. You wanna guess how many visits there were to museums in that same year? Well over 800 million visits. Everybody's already going. It's already the community spot. And then finally, and uh, I hope this isn't surprising to you, it kind of was a little bit to me, 
is according to a study from Indiana State, they found that museums are among the most trusted sources of information that we have. It's perceived to be by their visitors. More trusted than teachers, whether they are or not, that's the perception. More trusted than books, more trusted than the experience of their relatives. They rank the information they get at the museum more trustworthy than the information that they get from all three of those sources. So what do we have with our museums? The place where everybody's going, the place that's welcoming for everybody, and the place that people feel confident that the information that they get is neutral and trustworthy. I believe that we do not take advantage of our museums across the country. We go, but we don't take advantage of them to be the vehicle through which we can have this community dialogue. I believe that museums need to step up. Museums don't work hard enough to facilitate and maintain a healthy dialogue within their communities. So I hope that uh, our museum here and museums across the country can step up. And I hope communities will take more advantage of, a, of an extraordinary and wonderful opportunity to have a productive and meaningful dialogue about the many difficult challenges that are presented to us today and will be presented to us in the future. Thank you very much.